primary role of um, the uh, nurse specialist for multiple cirrhosis is um, one of support for patients diagnosed with multiple cirrhosis throughout their disease. Um, the role can also be taken on by um, neurology nurse specialists in um, hospitals in uh, which um, there is a neurologist. Um, but um, the support is um, has, has many facets to it. Um, obviously from diagnosis, um, when patients need a lot of support, um, to decisions on treatment um, and advice in relation to symptom management. Um, also a lot of the role is, is liaising with the multidisciplines, both within the hospitals and in the community. Um, so um, trying to access services for patients um, such as physio in the community, occupational therapy, um, it can be more difficult to, um, to do in the community um, because the, the services are, can be quite scant in certain areas. Um, also um, public health nurses, um, support for public health nurses and advice and um, GPs uh, can ring in at times um, in relation to advice and um, in relation to symptoms are, for instance, is this a relapse of MS and um, where should they proceed from there. Um, a lot of the role as well is in relation to um, advice to patients themselves um, in relation to symptom management, um, whether it's, it's bladder symptoms, pain phenomena, um, and indeed if they're having a relapse. Um, also, um, our role would involve a lot of um, family and carer support as well and giving advice to families and carers um, uh, of people who are diagnosed with multiple cirrhosis. Um, and also um, the MS nurse specialist would very much be uh, involved in an educative role, um, whether it's given talks or seminars to other nurses, uh, to community care providers, uh, to patients themselves, like for instance newly diagnosed weekends, um, and to student nurses. Um, also, um, our role would be predominantly of um, one of advocacy and obviously our, um, we're very much focused on individual patients and what they want and um, what, um, particularly on their wishes in relation to decisions in relation to treatment. Um, so very often we would advocate um, patients' wishes you know, um, to neurologists and other healthcare uh, providers as well. We would also liaise with other um, organisations within the community um, like um, MS Ireland um, and they have individual case workers who provide support for patients diagnosed with MS. Um, and the Irish Wheelchair Association um, for support measures and care support measures. Uh, so it's a big role, um, so there's many facets to it. Um, first contact is usually um, with patients is usually at level of diagnosis. Um, in a clinical situation, uh, the neurologist would give the diagnosis and hopefully the nurse specialist would be there on the day of diagnosis. Um, and very often patients are then immediately referred to the MS nurse specialist to give advice and support. Obviously at diagnosis, most patients, um, their first reaction um, is as an association with disability, especially if they don't know much about multiple cirrhosis. And people often think of the worst case scenario and the first thing most people think is, oh my God, am I going to be disabled? Um, and I think at this point it's very important, particularly the majority of patients are diagnosed with what is called relapsing remitting multiple cirrhosis, which is a treatable type of multiple cirrhosis. Um, and it's very important to, um, to relate to patients that, you know, in over the last 15 plus years, treatments for MS have emerged and a lot more people are living without disability for much longer periods. So say, for example, if a person was diagnosed 20 years ago, there'd be no treatments available for them, where now there are a number of treatments. Um, I think it's very important to, to um, be very positive with patients because obviously um, it can be difficult in the context of multiple sclerosis as a disease in itself is unpredictable. You cannot predict when somebody's next relapse is going to be. You cannot predict 
when this person is going to progress into disability necessarily. But um, I think it's very important to try and be as positive as possible because there are a large number of patients who attend our patient service who are doing very well for a very long time with their diagnosis. They were diagnosed 15, 20 years and they have no disability and they're doing very well. And most people associate MS with disability, even healthcare providers in the community and um, healthcare professionals in hospitals because they see the worst case scenario, people who are admitted uh, with severe disability or progression. So uh, um, I think it's very important to point that out to patients um, and to advise patients that not to let the diagnosis take over their life or their, their life plans. So if they're planning to go to college, if they're planning to change work, you know, to develop their career, whatever it is, not to let the diagnosis stop them, you know, take over their lives. Um, obviously, it's very important to simply, most people like a very simple explanation of what MS is, what multiple cirrhosis is, and it's very important to have a very simple explanation. Um, I would usually say that um, multiple cirrhosis is, most people would identify with, with the term autoimmune disease, and it's considered to be an autoimmune disease. And I'd usually explain what happens in an autoimmune disease is your fighter cells in your body that normally fight away infection, for some reason they are triggered and in autoimmune diseases, they identify normal cell types in the body as abnormal um, and attack them. Uh, and for some reason, they are triggered, and we don't know why, or they're not, it's not related to any specific uh, bacteria or virus. Um, and in the context of multiple cirrhosis, um, the cell type that they attack is myelin which is in the central nervous system. And I describe very simply what myelin is and that the nervous system is a network of nerve cells and nerve bodies um, and messages are passed to and from the brain um, through this complex process. And the myelin is the substance that uh, surrounds the nerve body. Um, and I would uh, equate myelin with, say, the plastic covering on, on a wire, the same function. Um, that the plastic covering on the wire, it protects the nerve body, it insulates and it promotes smooth transmission of messages to and from the brain. So if there's some inflammation in a specific area um, in the central nervous system or destruction of myelin, there's going to be um, a disruption um, in messages. So as a result, somebody would present with a sensory symptom if it was a sensory nerve pathway, uh, like numbness or tingling in a hand or an arm or if it was motor, it would be power or movement. So it, to describe it in a very simplistic term, um, at the level of diagnosis, I don't particularly like to go uh, too in-depthly into potential symptoms in relation to MS because it can relate uh, quite a negative effect for patients. And everybody's disease course is very individual. And symptoms are literally head to toe, from visual to sensory, to bladder, to bowel, to pain phenomena, to spasms. And because there's such a variance, you know, limb weakness, coordination, dizziness, there's so many symptoms associated with MS, that it can have a quite a depressive effect on patients that what could potentially happen in relation to MS. So I would advise patients not to read too in-depthly into potential symptoms, but the most important thing for them is how to identify a relapse. And I usually relate, and this kind of empowers patients in the context of that they, to advise them when to contact us and when you know it is important to see us between clinic visits. Um, and obviously this is part of our role, we're the main um, phone support in the hospital, the main point of contact for patients diagnosed with MS. So it's important to advise them that they can contact us, they can contact the MS nurse specialist um, if they're concerned about symptoms, if they think they have new symptoms, and particularly if the symptoms are prolonged, and this is how they identify a relapse, that if they have a new set of symptoms or similar symptoms to what they had before, but the fact that they're constant, they're there at least 24 to 72 hours and that's when they know they have a relapse. Because some patients have a tendency to ring in in a panic and say my arm was numb for an hour and 
you know, the ring and the panic, and they, they could have slept on their arm. Um, and uh, sometimes day-to-day -day body stresses can bring on a symptom that would last half an hour, like exercise, increased body temperature, but they're not relapses, they're nothing to be concerned about. Um, they're just intermittent symptoms that um, are caused by day-to-day -day stresses and strains. Um, but once you give patients that, even that level of information, it gives them an element of comfort in the context of, I have somebody to contact if I'm worried. And very often it's just um, patients need reassurance over the phone. And then if they need to be seen sooner, we arrange for them to come in. And we try and do treatment um, on an outpatient basis if a patient has a relapse, for instance, um, to avoid inpatient admission, we give them um, IV steroid therapy as outpatients. So we avoid patient admission as much as we can. And um, this makes it much easier for patients. You know, they don't like to be hospitalized. Um, but, um, and obviously um, during diagnosis, you would give the contact numbers for support. And obviously um, I would certainly advise patients um, to contact the lo their local MS Society caseworker um, who is the community level of support for them because there's no social worker provision for people under 65 with chronic illness. So the MS Society caseworkers kind of fill in that role. Um, they work as community workers. So if patients need, whether it's somebody objective outside of the hospital to talk about their, somebody non-medical, to talk about their diagnosis, to sit and meet with and have coffee. Um, very often I tell patients that you know you don't necessarily have to join groups and talk about your feelings because not everybody's in, into that level, but that the, they're there to support them um, at an advisory level from a social point of view, whether it's problems of work, whether it's family issues, and you know, um, and it might not necessarily be just centered around diagnosis, but obviously other stressors in life don't help your disease or your diagnosis. Um, but I think it's very important at diagnosis level to let patients know that these supports are there um, for them. Obviously, if the hospital, if somebody can contact the hospital, you'd usually advise patients their first point of contact is their GP. Um, but usually if the GP is unsure about the symptoms or where to go you know, with the patient, they, they usually contact the neurology team. Then um, after diagnosis, obviously, um, most patients, um, especially if they've had two episodes, two relapses um, from the first episode of symptoms, uh, we would usually offer patients uh, treatment, um, which would be um, disease-modifying therapies. There's four on the market. Um, there's three interferon-based um, disease-modifying therapies and one um, which is a synthetically made drug uh, called Laterum or acetate. The effect of the disease modifying therapies is the very same. So what you'd usually do is um, offer all four because um, the idea is to dampen down um, immune cell activity and the outcome of these disease modifying therapies would be to uh, prevent relapse rate by reduce it by about 30% on average. So the effect of all these treatments is, are very similar, um, on average 30% all four treatments. So um, it's very important that, that patients can be given the choice to make an, um, an informed decision themselves after they're given the information uh, they're usually given the booklet information on all four treatments and advised about potential benefits, all this, um, the most common side effects associated with the treatment um, and um, obviously the treatment regimes, how often all these um, treatments require self-injection and there's support nurses attached to each company that teaches them how to self-inject. If patients have worsening relapsing remitting disease, um, for example, if they have two or more relapses in a year um, and or more disabling relapses, higher disease activity, these particular patients that are higher risk because uh, of accumulating um, disease burden quicker and developing into secondary progressive MS quicker um, and this particular co window of patients, cohort of pa patients, um, are offered Tysabri which is um, given intravenously once a month. 
Now, Tysabri has a much better treatment effect, but more risks. So that's why it's um, offered to this specific group. Um, and the reduction of relapse rate um, with Tysabri on average is about 68%. But because there is associated risk with the drug, um, it's just this particular window of patients. So these particular patients need a lot of counselling pre-treatment. Um, it's a difficult decision to make because obviously if there's risks involved, but it's just very important that patients are, are aware of th this information before they um, make that decision, um, like all treatments options. Obviously, um, when patients in relation to long-term support, um, symptom management is a, is a big part. Um, so patients would very often relate um, issues with symptoms such as nerve pain phenomena, uh, bladder symptoms, um, spasms in, in the legs or the arms, and obviously uh, advice on medication that's available for these particular symptoms is a big part of um, the job as well. A lot of medication like nerve pain medication, antispasmodic drugs, ha um, very frequently do have side effects. So it's very important to be aware of that and very often patients ring up complaining of side effects. Um, but obviously that's a big part of our role as well, you know, and obviously community healthcare professionals very often ring up for advice about symptom management with patients, whether it's um, very often bladder symptoms and management uh, continence issues is a, big, uh, is a big part of the job. We don't have a continence nurse in St. Vincent's Hospital, so a lot of the continence advice is left up to the MS nurse specialist. Um, but uh, there are very few continence nurses in the community as well, unfortunately. But it, yeah, it's very good for us within our role uh, because a big part of it is educating yourself and what is um, the most updated research and management of these specific um, symptoms. Um, so it helps to keep, keep your knowledge base updated as well.